today the whole program is about stress. We're asking what it is and how to stop it taking over your life. And we're launching a pioneering psychological experiment into the causes of mental health problems. We want thousands of people to take part. It's online and you'll get immediate feedback on your current levels of stress, which coping strategies you use and tips on how to deal with it better. And there's a scientific question behind all this. Why does stress tip over into anxiety and depression for some people, but not others? And later on, I take a lesson on how to stop ruminating in the middle of the night. Move your attention to your breathing. Just noticing the breath. It doesn't have to be any particular place. It could be the sensations of the breath at the tip of the nose, or down in the chest, or down in the abdomen. But first, what is stress? I went out onto the streets of Oxford to see what people there think. What is stress? Well, no, what is stress? <laughs> well, when you get uptight and you, uh, you know, you want to explode, I suppose. I just... Uh, yeah. How can I explain it? It's like something you really don't want. You want to relax and you don't want to hear about it. And it's actually inside your head. That's it. It's when I think you have numerous pressure points on your mind and you don't seem to be able to resolve any of them, whether home or work or in their own personal life. It's dealing with them all together. Stress? We're stressed. retired. Retired <laughs> and on holiday. <laughs> We're not stressed out at all. Life's good. Now, a lot of those things they mentioned are going to be coming up in today's programme. And I want to introduce my first guest today, Angela Clo, Professor of Psychophysiology at the University of Westminster. I mean, we heard those people there, and we all use this word, stress, but does it have a scientific definition? Is it anxiety and depression that we're talking about, really? Or what, what does it mean? Well, it's a very interesting question, Claudia, and I'm glad you started here, because it's not an easy thing to define, and there's no single definition of stress out there. But as a psychophysiologist, the definition we use in, the, in our field of work is that we're looking at how people respond to negative life events outside them. And that response can be across a whole range of areas, making people have negative thoughts, negative emotions, and actually can change their behaviours as well. So you're only counting, in a sense, the bad things. What about an event like, I don't know, you give a presentation at work or something, you might say beforehand, oh, I'm really stressed, I'm really anxious about this, but afterwards, assuming it went well, then, then you're pleased you did it. Well, there's a difference to be drawn between stress and arousal. And if people have a fear of failure, they don't feel they're equipped to deal with the demands of the, of the presentation or life in general, then that can build up in feelings of stress and anxiety. But if they feel that they're equipped and prepared, then that can be a positive achievement motivation and, um, and, a, and an, an enjoyable experience rather than a negative stressful experience. And when there is a negative stressful experience, how much do we know about what's actually happening in the body? Is it stress hormones that are making us feel bad? Absolutely. There's been a lot of research over the last 10 to 15 years examining exactly what happens in the body after a stressful response to an event in life. And there's a lot going on in the body. It's not just one's imagination that's one feeling stress. There's a cascade of biological events that take hold. And if that's sustained over long periods of time, it can have um, impact on a range of biological systems. And one of the stress hormones you hear a lot about is, is cortisol. So does that I mean cortisol is a bad thing? Well, absolutely not. Cortisol is an essential hormone for life. Um, but the problem with cortisol is it's so essential. It's got so many housekeeping roles to maintain our healthy body function. But it's got a secondary role as a stress hormone. And when stress kicks in repeatedly and uh, for in intense periods of time, then what happens is its role as a stress hormone overrides its role as a housekeeping hormone. And you get, um, you get downstream processes going awry, unfortunately. So the balance kind of goes wrong in a sense. Absolutely. We weren't evolved really to, to be subjective to repeated long-term stress as can happen in modern society. So how does it hijack the body? Well, what actually happens? Ah, well, you see, the main problem, the main issue about cortisol is its primary role is to regulate 24-hour cycles. There's what we call a circadian or 24-hour pattern in cortisol secretion. And in a healthy person, you get a marked 24-hour pattern with a peak in the morning, gets you out of bed. So gets helps you, you get up. Gets, helps you get out, energizes you, prepares you for the day. It's absolutely not a bad thing. But the important thing is after that burst in the morning you get this steady decline so there's low levels before you go to bed and what happens in chronic stress situations is you get a flattening of that profile and in particular you might have low levels in the morning which is bad because you're not prepared for the day and 
at high levels at night, which are also very bad for you because that can interfere with your sleep patterns and um, affect other biological processes downstream. So it's not as straightforward as saying that you end up with too much cortisol because you're stressed. It's that this pattern, this balance of it going up and down during the 24-hour cycle Absolutely. goes wrong in a sense. It's all about dynamics of change over the day. Well, I want to come back to you in a moment. And when you think of stress at work, you might think of stressed bosses and the pressures driving them into an early grave. But the Whitehall study, which has followed civil servants for more than four decades, has shown something rather different. It's not the managers whose lives are cut short by stress. The pioneer in this field is Professor Sir Michael Marmot from University College London. And he told me why his research has turned existing ideas on their head. Conventional wisdom was that high status people had higher risk of heart attacks. And so we expected that high-status people indeed would have more heart disease. So it's the classic sort of stressed executive of a company who's rushing about all the time and then gets so stressed they have a heart attack. And that's what people said. And you read in the newspapers about chief executives, politicians, football managers, the stress was causing the heart attack. High-status people would get it. And we found exactly the opposite. What we found was not just that people down the bottom had higher rate of mortality from heart disease, but those in the middle had higher rate than those at the top. In fact, it was a finely graded relation. The lower you were in the hierarchy, the higher the risk of mortality from heart disease, but from all other major causes of death. And you'd think that, at first blush, the British Civil Service is an unlikely place to look at social differentials in health. It excludes the richest people in society. It excludes the poorest. These are people in white-collar jobs, in office jobs, stable employment. So you'd think that they might be fairly homogeneous. And yet we found this dramatic relation between people's grade of employment and their mortality. But the real challenge was to say, why would somebody with a university education who's not at the very top have a higher mortality than the people above them in the hierarchy who are at the very top. They're not poor. So were you surprised when you first found that? Did you oh. think, oh, this just must be some quirk, this can't possibly be true? You know, they're all fine, they can all pay for the health care they need if they need to pay for it, or they can pay for the food they need, they've got good housing. I spent two years trying to disprove it, because <laughs> I couldn't believe it, that there must be something wrong with it. I spent a lot of time trying to look for alternate explanations, but we didn't find them. Well, it's a remarkable idea that people at the top of the pile have more stress than people at the bottom. I mean, we somehow take it for granted that the chief executive has more stress than the person working in the office. And the key issue about stress in the workplace is not how much pressure you have on you, but how much control you have over the pressure on you. And that, of course, goes down as you go down the hierarchy. We see this now this social gradient in health, as I call it, we see it very widespread. We see it in other countries. We see it in low-income, middle-income and high-income countries. I mean, it's a very widespread phenomenon. It's not unique to British civil servants. Now, Angela, Michael Marmot was saying this is all about control. How does this sense of a lack of control fit in with the effects of stress on the brain and on the body? Well, it's all about being able to manage what's going on and having the resources to manage what's going on. And also I think it's important, as Michael Marmot pointed out, that if you have lack of control, it's indicative that you're quite low down the hierarchy and you're being told what to do by other people. And you might have people above you and below you squeezing you, and but you're not able to, to, to do anything to change the situation. So you're, you're mopping up the stress from above and below. And so I think, and, 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 and there's nothing you can do. So things are out of your control and yet you're taking the, the rap for it. And how does that translate to then affecting your body and stopping you living as long? Well, that can cause that can cause real stress. And it, don't forget, if, you, if this is happening in the workplace, then it's, it's sustained over weeks and years even. And over that period of time, it can have real negative effects via affecting the way the body operates, as we talked about, the cortisol and how the heart's beating and things like that, and have it negative effects on health. And eventually, as Michael Marmot's work's shown, um, be associated with early mortality. 
It sounds dramatic, but in actual fact, the evidence is out there that this is true. Thanks very much, Angela, and, and do stay with us. So today on All in the Mind, we want your help with our huge online psychological experiment, the BBC Stress Test. BBC Lab UK, the part of the BBC that conducts scientific experiments, has been working with clinical psychologist Professor Peter Kinderman from the University of Liverpool to create this experiment. And Peter joins me now. I mean, this is an ambitious um, project. What's the key scientific aim of what you're hoping to discover? with the help of thousands of Radio 4 listeners? Um, yes, it is ambitious, and I think it, it's something that can only be done with the help of so many listeners, because what we're trying to do is to analyse the relationship between many of the things that Angela has mentioned. So we're looking at socioeconomic status, employment, education. We're looking at stressful life events that people have experienced. We're looking at how people respond, and then we're trying to measure some of the consequences of those. So we're putting it all together and analysing the relationship between those variables, and you need very large numbers of people to do that. And has anything quite like this been done before? Not to my knowledge, no. Obviously, psychologists are, and psychiatrists and biologists are very interested in the relationships between all of these variables. Putting them together into one package is quite ambitious because of the number of participants that you need. And to be honest, we need the BBC to help us. Now, I've done the test. It's online. It takes about 20 minutes. It's all confidential. It's all anonymous. Can you go a bit through what it consists of? OK, there, there's quite a few different parts to it. So we ask some basic questions about people and their background, including some questions about uh, people's family experience of mental health problems to try to get at some of the possibly even biological vulnerabilities that people might have. There's quite a few questions about income, about education, about occupation. Then there are some questions about life events that people might have experienced, negative life events in the past year, and also uh, dating back to childhood, asking about bullying and other negative experiences that might be part of the pattern of stress that people are experiencing. We ask some questions about how people respond in stressful uh, situations and how people explain the stressful events that they come across. Yes, yeah, so you get some scenarios there yeah. and you can, you're can you asked who you'd blame for a different Absolutely. scenario. Would you blame yourself? Would you blame the other person or outside circumstances? I quite like this bit because there's a kind of slider and you can slide it across to say your answer, so it's quite fun. It's fun technology. We try to make it, we try to make it entertaining. We also ask some questions uh, or give people some tests, rather, that tap into how the sort of more fundamental processes of the brain are responding. So there's some uh, almost computer games that people uh, have to play involving matching uh, symbols to samples and involving playing with positive and negative words that aim to explore how the brain is processing information to do with stress. And then finally we're looking at depression and anxiety and a sense of well-being that might be some of the consequences of the stress as well. And when people fill all this in, what sort of feedback do you get straight away? Um, you get a lot of feedback on most parts of the experiment. So obviously people get feedback about why we're asking questions about level of income, education, things to do with people's families. You also get feedback on whether the levels of stressful life experiences that people have experienced are high or medium or low compared to other people. You get feedback on the styles of responding to stressful life events that you yourself are experiencing and some indication of why those might be helpful or unhelpful for people. And finally, you get feedback on people's levels of, of stress itself, whether people have high or medium or low levels of stress compared to the other people taking part in the experiment. So how will these tests then help you when you've got the results from thousands of people? How will they help you to find out what it is that tips someone over into anxiety and depression if they've got some stressful circumstances? Some theories would suggest that people become stressed because of the life events that occur to them. Some people stress the way in which people respond to life events. And other people see your responses to stressful events as the consequence of depression or anxiety. So, for instance, withdrawal and rumination as symptoms of depression or anxiety. What we're trying to do is get enough data from enough people to look at the relationship between those variables, to get some idea of which causes what, whether ruminating is a consequence of leading a stressful lifestyle or the cause of your subjective stress, and try to work out the relationship between those variables. And can an online test really tell us something this complex when you've got so many variables? Yes. I mean, technically, what it is, is it's about how much of the variance in people's experiences are explained by different combinations of the, uh, of the tests that we're doing. So whether one arrangement of A causing B is better at explaining the data than B causing A. 
It's not perfect doing it all on an online experiment. We can't, for instance, test genetics or test cortisol levels, but we can get some idea of it. And one of the benefits of doing it online is you get very large numbers of people, which enables us to test the relationship between a large number of variables. So in a sense, you're trying to pin down the main causes of mental health problems. Well, we're trying to test hypotheses. So back in 2005, I published a paper where I suggested that there were two different competing theories for the relationship between those variables and in a sense we'd be waiting for the opportunity to test those those two theories against each other and we can do that. Uh, we can do something slightly better though than just look at the relationships between variables in one online test and what we hope to do is to invite people to come back after they've taken the test, so after six months or a while after they've taken the test, to come back to see whether the relationship between the variables taken at time one will predict people's experience of stress over the next six months. And then we can look at data collected at one time, predicting people's experiences into the future. And that's a much more reliable test of any scientific experiment. So when people fill in the test now, they've got the option to, to leave their details if yeah. they want to, so that they can be contacted and take part in the follow-up as well. Yeah, that's right. And it's important to stress that this is very confidential, that there's no way that people other than ourselves as the scientists involved will get to see the data. It'll all be anonymised, in fact, before I get to see it. So all I'll get is complicated computer codes telling me the relationship between the variables rather than any personal details. Uh, it's also been approved by a properly com uh, constituted ethical committee, so people can be absolutely assured that their data will be treated in confidence. Angela, you're still with us and, and you've had a go at the test. How, how did you find it? I thought it was brilliant. I think it's a great way to raise awareness of the importance of stress and life events in dictating how people can live their lives in terms of their mental health, their well-being. And it would also be interesting, and I know this isn't Peter's particular interest, to look at physical health outcomes as well, because um, just looking at the relationship between stress and mental health is just part of the picture. And real physical pathology, you know, it, effects in the immune system and, and the cardiovascular system, the metabolic system is also associated with stress. So um, raising the awareness of the importance of stress is really important. Now you mentioned rumination, Peter, where you worry away at the same thing over and over again and we've, we've all experienced it and I wanted to learn how to stop doing it in the middle of the night. So yesterday I went to Oxford University to meet clinical psychologist Professor Mark Williams. There's evidence that learning the techniques of mindfulness can help to reduce anxiety and stress and it's even been included in the NICE guidelines for preventing relapse rates in people with depression. So before he showed me how to do it, I asked him exactly what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is a translation of a word that simply means awareness. It's direct, intuitive knowing of what you're doing while you're doing it. It's a knowing what's going on inside your mind and body and what's going on in the outside world as well. So what is it about developing awareness of, of yourself and what's around you, why should that help you with something like anxiety or depression? Because in all emotional difficulties, awareness helps because most of the time our attention is not where we had intended it to be. Attention is hijacked by our emotions, by our concerns, by our worries for the future and our regrets for the past. Mindful awareness is about learning to pay attention in the present moment and without harsh criticism. And that means that it's like training a muscle, training attention to be where you want it to be. And that doesn't mean that you can't plan or you can't remember. It means that you're not, as it were, caught and entangled in worries about the future and in regrets about the past. So can you take me through a meditation on what we do? Say I'm awake in the middle of the night worrying about things and they're, they're going over and over in your mind and then you get more and more anxious and then you get anxious because you can't sleep and you know you'll be tired next day and you'll make it worse. What can you do? The first thing is to recognize what's happening. So if you use a three-step approach, this would be probably most helpful, and we call it the three-minute breathing space. First of all, acknowledge what's going on, actually recognizing that your mind is racing, that you don't like it, but that it's okay not to like it. It's very often people think that a breathing space is going straight to the breath, but that there's a first crucial step, which is to acknowledge what's happening in your mind and body right now and allow it to be just as it is. Really just making a mental note. Ah, thinking, thinking, worrying, worrying. And that sense of just spending a few moments acknowledging what's going on can be really helpful because most of the time we don't acknowledge. We just try to fix things as quickly as we can and the very fixing can backfire. And then when you spend perhaps about a, a minute 
focusing and allowing it to be there rather than trying to push it away and suppress it or getting tangled in it, then the second step is to move your attention to your breathing. Just noticing the breath. It doesn't have to be any particular place. It could be the sensations of the breath at the tip of the nose or down in the chest or down in the abdomen. And the task here is simply to follow the breath all the way in and all the way out without trying to control it, just noticing the sensations of breathing in and breathing out. And if your mind wanders, simply acknowledge where it went and come back to the breath. And if your mind wanders again, again. Acknowledge where it's gone and come back to the breath. So you're using your breath as an anchor to anchor yourself in the present moment. And then continue doing that for up to a minute. And then the third step of the breathing space is to attend to your body as a whole. So now you're expanding the attention which has been focused on the breath to your body as a whole. Noticing what's going on in your body. You might find, for example, there are sensations in the cells of your feet or in your legs or the torso. You might notice your facial expression. And noticing what sensations are there in your body from the crown of your head to the bottom of your feet and allow them to be just as they are. Does it matter if they're negative? I and mean, what if you then notice aches and pains and won't you then start focusing on those? If you focus on the aches and pain, you may notice that your mind will take you away from the raw sensations in the body to thoughts about them. Often you'll say, oh, I wish this wasn't here, I wish I could get back to sleep, I wish this wasn't happening to me, I wish I was somewhere else. And the task here is just to notice your mind going off and come back to the sensations, the raw physical sensations in your body, which themselves, in themselves, don't carry that weight of information, that weight of meaning. It's the meaning we add to them that often compounds the situation. And if we can bring awareness to that link between sensations themselves and thoughts about them, then that awareness itself begins to uncouple the sensations from our thoughts about them. And often people experience at that point a sense of uh, relief and a release from the having to go round and round and round and round. And why concentrate on the body? Why is that something that's helpful? Well, it does take some practice to focus on the body without your mind beginning to tell you stories about what's going on. We're talking about here concentrating on the body because the bodily sensations you can have direct knowledge of. Nobody else can tell you what you're thinking or feeling in your body. When we say we're worried, we're preoccupied, we're ruminating, we're brooding, when we worry, when, we, when stress gets to us, we exhaust ourselves by getting entangled in our heads as we try to solve the problem. And when we put our attention in our body, what we're seeing there, what we're able to feel, is feeling and perceiving directly sensations. Whereas our thoughts, thoughts about work, thoughts about somebody else, thoughts about our stresses, that's indirect. Our worries, the things that we're focused on, other people as well, are indirect. Whereas our body is direct. It takes a bit of time to cultivate this, but people find it's worth the effort. Those worries are still going to be there and are very real, you know, important things to you and, and they could be about things that are going seriously wrong in your life. So how is it somehow minimising them to, to raise your awareness? One of the things about mindfulness is that it doesn't say that these worries are unimportant. It points out that often when we start to worry and ruminate, the patterns that the mind produces are not actually just about the worry itself but how nothing will ever be solved, how dreadful it is that you can't solve them. They remind you often of past events, and so you're, you end up dealing not just with the current worry, but with a whole sense of hopelessness that might come from the past, not actually about now. And you can't actually see where the now worry starts and stops, and where it's being, as it were, infected and imbued with past other worries and regrets that actually don't belong to it. What mindfulness does is allow you to see this more clearly. And that allows people to actually focus on the real thing. In the middle of the night, very often, you have a worry which is like a seed of reality surrounded by a shell of story. And you just find yourself constantly caught by the story. And it's often a story about yourself and how bad you are, how you're not good enough, how you've never been good enough. And that isn't actually the worry that started it. It actually can prevent you from seeing clearly what possible solutions there might be there.
Professor Mark Williams, and I tried it last night, and I only got to stage one before I fell back to sleep again. So if you want to learn some more mindfulness techniques, you'll find a link to details of books as well as courses in your area if you go to the All in the Mind page of the Radio 4 website. And of course, mindfulness is just one way of reducing stress. So I asked the people in the streets of Oxford what they did to relax. Play games on my computer. Just go out for a walk. That's it. There's no point shouting or screaming, is there? Taking stock periodically and, and just sort of calming yourself down and trying to itemise what has to be done and, and also realising that some problems don't have solutions and that takes some of the pressure off. Certainly exercise helps a lot. Oh, a bit of meditation, I suppose. Sort of just trying to relax and chilling out and uh, processing thoughts that stress you out to make you feel that, you know, to make you realise that it's not that stressful, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I go and play computers. Go and play, fa go on Facebook and just veg out and not do too much. And I read a book. So, Angela, how about some of those suggestions? We know there's evidence that mindfulness works, but what about exercise and so on? What evidence is there for well, that? Well, it's so interesting. There's a, a strong emerging evidence base that physical exercise, regular physical exercise that you want to do, actually can buffer the effects of negative life events and stop some of the stress-associated illnesses that we've been talking about earlier. So I'd really recommend physical exercise. And another thing that's important to pay attention to is your sleep hygiene, really, because sleep and and night and day, as you say, is very pivotal in all this stress responding. And making sure that you have good sleep hygiene, as I say, a nice, quiet, dark room to go to bed in at a regular time can be very helpful. And of course, the big stress buffer in the world is using your social support, talking to people about how you feel and engaging with those people, articulating how you feel so you get another person's perspective on it. Peter, do you have any final tips on reducing stress? Um, well, unfortunately, most of the tips have been occupied by other people, so absolutely endorse exercise, absolutely endorse uh, mindfulness, absolutely endorse uh, sleep. Uh, friends and social support, fantastic, better than therapists. Um, I think one thing that I would add is the importance of how we make sense of things. People's emotional life, people's mental health, people's behaviour, emotions, uh, are largely dictated by how they make sense of the world around them. And how we make sense of the world around us is largely dictated by the experiences that we ourselves have had in life. One important message is it's possible to change that. That's where clinical psychology comes in. It's learning to look at the world in a different way. And a very simple way of doing that is a phrase that some psychologists have started to use, which is catch it, check it, change it. Very similar to how Mark Williams was talking about. You catch your thoughts, you check them out, and if necessary, you change your attitude towards things. Well, thanks very much, Peter Kinderman and Angela Klo. And Peter, you'll be back with the results, I hope, in a few months' time. And remember, you can take part in the BBC stress test by going to bbc.co.uk forward slash lab UK.